I'm Jason. I'm the principal clarinetist of the Colorado Symphony in Denver, but right now I'm in Texas. So hello from Round Top, Texas, where I teach at the festival here. Thank you so much for being here. And um, Jessica and I were talking about this uh, right before we were starting about how what an important topic this is for us to be chatting about mouthpieces. No, I'm kidding. But performance anxiety and living with it and how do we how are we confident and how can we get confidence and how can we bring it to our students as well. So we're very short on obviously time in general. It's only 25 minutes. So um, if you have not looked at the handout yet, that should be part of this session. Um, please go ahead and open that and take that. Um, Jessica, I think just put it in the chat just in case. Um, and um, if you need it, please put in the chat, look in there and you can click the link. Um, on that handout, I have a lot of information and I'm going to kind of cover the most important stuff in our short time here. Um, and of course, then I'm going to save some time at the end of the little 25 minutes so that we can answer some questions that you might have put in the chat as well. Um, but I also have my email address in the handout as well. So if we don't get to your question and you want to follow up on something, please feel free to shoot me an email anytime. Um, I'm really happy to be in touch with you. Um, so what we're talking about today is living with performance anxiety. And the reason I titled it this is because we often think, okay, I want to get rid of my performance anxiety. I want to Get, I don't want to be nervous ever again. I'm terrified of being nervous. And one of the most important things we need to realize is that I think the healthiest goal is to learn how to improve our ability to perform with our nerves. You know, I think it's an unreasonable goal to try to get rid of it. And it can make us feel worse, actually, if we think that it's a bad thing and we're fighting it all the time. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today and a lot of what I cover in the handout here is ways that we can have our performance anxiety get nervous and we can still perform well with it so on the first page here kind of in the second section i wanted to cover the most important aspect for me which is the idea of different performance mindsets and what you'll realize is that performance anxiety affects us in so many different ways. We can get paralyzed physically, we can get paralyzed mentally. There's so many different things that can happen to your playing when you're feeling incredibly stressed, when you're feeling nervous. And what I think the most important single concept, if I can really throw this out there, is understanding that what we do with our conscious focus, our mindset, is the real key to be working on overcoming this. So what I say in this in the handout is that we need to work on practicing the performance mindset. So most of us are extremely good at getting in the practice room and beating ourselves up and working on tons of notes and you know fixing all the issues and being really critical of ourselves and solving problems. And what we don't do enough is actually practice letting go and trusting. And many of you have probably heard of the book, The Inner Game of Tennis. And it's one of my favorite books. It's really short. It's really worth reading if you haven't read it before. And one of its basic concept is that this tennis coach realized that during tennis games, he was trying to tell his students to improve during the tennis game. And he was saying, okay, hey, watch your swing, watch what you're doing with your wrist when you're when you're doing your when you're doing your swing and the ball's coming at you. And he noticed that all of his students got worse when he was telling them to change things about this swing, to change things about their technique, to be critical of themselves. And when he said, just keep your eye on the ball coming at you, it helped them focus essentially on something that was letting them trust themselves, letting them trust to do the things they knew how to do. So when it, with music, what we really want to get better at is we are critical of ourselves in the practice room, we fix our issues, and then we have to practice trusting that we can actually do those things. So let, what, I, what I kind of also lay out here as an example of, okay, now how do we do this? Let's say one of your issues with performance anxiety is that you just get so nervous and as part of that nerves, you're really just scared and you're critical of yourself and you get just mentally frozen as you play. And one of the first things you can do is you work up your piece a little bit, you're starting to learn your piece, and then by yourself in the practice room with absolutely nobody watching, you close your eyes and you say, okay, I'm on stage, I'm going to perform now. And I'm gonna run through this phrase or this section or just a little bit of the piece. And you push yourself to do that run through 
letting go of self-critique. And you might not be able to do that at first. It might take some time before you can do that, even just by yourself with nobody listening to you. But the idea behind gradually increasing, what you'll see on the handout is I say that we're working to gradually increase our successful and good experiences with getting into the performance mindset. So the first step is to do it by yourself. I used to set up my stuffed animals in a corner on the bed and I'd perform for my stuffed animals. And that was the way I, I started to practice getting in that mindset. So let's say you do that a few times in a row and let's say, you okay, by the time a couple of weeks have gone on and now that I've practiced 10 or 15 times of getting in that mindset, it's getting better. Then you can try the next step, which I put on here, which is put a recording device on and record yourself. That's usually enough to get the anxiety even higher. Do that a few times. The next step, a run through for a good friend, someone you really trust. And for many of us, myself included, this is when someone else is in the room. This is when I get the most nervous, when I really feel it happen. And so it's very likely that at one of the steps in this process, you see I put run through for a good friend, run through for someone you don't know at all, and a mock performance for a group. You see I have kind of layers of how do you stress yourself out gradually more and more. As you progress through those steps, you might reach a point where let's where it doesn't go well and you have a friend come in the room and you play and it feels terrible and you're like, I was so nervous and I felt awful. That's completely OK. That is you working on this and getting better practicing that performance mindset. So that what you do at that point, you take a break and you do it again. That's okay. Maybe the next part you only feel about 5% better. And that's also okay. Accept that. That's great. So you have to realize that what we're doing here, again, is that you want, let's say you do five run throughs for good friends. You're not evaluating how well you played or how good your read was or how good your sound was or any of those things. You are evaluating how good you felt, how you could feel, how close you were to staying in that, going for the music and just letting go of that critique and trusting your preparation. So I wanted to make that very clear is that the success of gradually doing this and getting better and better at getting into the performance mindset is a gradual process. And it's something in which you have to accept and be okay with the fact that it's never going to be 100%. It's always going to just be gradually a little bit better and better and better. The goal of all of this is that you can go on stage at a performance and you can say, hey, I've had five or six performances of this piece already where I've played for my friend or I played for this person or I played for a group and I was nervous and I played well with my nerves. You know, it, it wasn't perfect, but I played well. That's to me, if you can get to that point where you are having enough performance mindset experiences that you can draw on them, when you go on stage to perform, that's when you will start to really see progress with getting in the performance mindset and with allowing yourself to trust that. So what you'll see is I, um, I'm gonna skip quite a bit of this because of time, um, but I have next on here an example of a possible way to kind of pace yourself before a stressful performance or audition, which you'll see kind of goes from mostly practice mindset to as I get closer to the performance or audition, I'm mostly in the performance mindset 90% of the time, even in the practice room. So you'll see that there. But I wanted to skip ahead to kind of the last section of this handout, which is some other elements of this, because it's obviously performance anxiety and confidence is a tremendously complicated topic. And one of my goals today, and in my goals in giving this to you, is for you to have a lot of tools to choose from to try. So I wanted to cover a few more of those. And the first thing in this section is when we're guiding our students with this, I think one of the most important things, of course, is for us to do this ourselves and to learn what works for us. But what I see as the biggest problem most of the time in teaching is it just doesn't get addressed at all. You might have had teachers that if you've talked to them about being nervous or if you've talked to them about confidence, they just say, well, practice harder, you know, believe in yourself. You know, it, it's, it's amazing how often we don't talk about this enough. And I think what I wanted to just really say about kind of the pedagogy of this is that you want to listen 
to what your students say about how they feel about performing in particular and to say recommend to them a lot of the tools here and you might see that specific some of the tools that i'm mentioning on here are really good for some students not so good for others that's okay but what we do want is we want to nurture our students ability to get into that performance mindset and trust themselves so for example even in lessons as a student's getting closer to a performance i make sure they have a lesson where they have to walk into the room and they say who if they have to announce their piece or whatever they do that for me and they play through the piece like that we i think the lesson before a big performance i never ever nitpick on those tiny little details because at this point it's all about helping our students trust themselves more and be able to perform the best they can at their level of preparation so i think pedagogically i really try to think about an individualized plan for each student and this is even from the very beginning the youngest students in the first time playing the clarinet they'll probably experience some of this fear. And even those first students learning their quarter notes, whatever, all those things, I'll have them perform their little pieces for each other or perform for the, their parents before they have to play a concert. Um, and it goes all the way up to, you know, young professionals taking auditions, anybody that you teach. Um, I think so much of this is about if you talk through this with a student and you give them some of these ideas and you as a teacher are guiding them into making sure they're using it. Um, I wanted to just add one more thing pedagogically before I cover another couple of quick things and we'll get to some questions as well. Um, I have had students and some of you may have as well that have really crippling performance anxiety that really have such a hard time getting on stage and doing this. And one of the things I've found that is most of the time an issue with these students is an excessive amount of negativity towards themselves, excessive amount of negativity towards their playing and negativity in the practice room. And so I didn't put this on the handout, but one of the things that I do with those students is I actually assign them to keep a practice journal where they write three positive things every time they practice about something they accomplished and about how they sounded. And I always make them also reflect after performances how did you feel when you played did were you able what did you think went really well in terms of how you felt what didn't go so well and being able to see their own playing in a balanced way where we always have things to improve on yes and we also always have things that went well and that we want to be proud of ourselves when we do so i found that it doesn't help a student and i tell them this it doesn't help them in one week you know, it takes a long time. It takes a journey of thinking that way until it starts to compound and the brain really learns. Yes, I can trust myself. Yes, I have good things in my playing. So I wanted to really make sure I spent a little bit of time addressing that. Um, so before we get to some questions, the, you'll see in this final section, a few other tips. This idea of visualization, where you close your eyes and you imagine details of a performance um, and you are imagining yourself playing confidently, you know, you're imagining those, it, that is actually a very, very powerful tool when it comes to um, this idea of if you close your eyes and imagine and visualize a performance, your brain is actually learning during that process. It is learning, yes, okay, I'm imagining being nervous and I'm imagining playing well through the nerves. Doing that every day for a couple of weeks, two weeks, three weeks before a performance is a very effective tool. It's been proven in a lot of studies. Um, I've mentioned about acceptance already. And I did wanna mention, um, we'll see how many questions we have. If we have a little extra time for me to just keep on blabbing, I may do that. But um, I, I did want to mention absolutely the bigger picture of setting goals for a performance. Um, I find that it's one of the biggest issues with students that students will say, well, my goal for this performance is to play perfectly and to impress all the teachers or impress or impress the panel or impress anything. And what all that does is place pressure on yourself. So a lot of what I do is I tell students to make the goal as I'm going to play my best and I'm going to show off my strengths and I'm going to do the best I really, when I mean best, I mean the best I can under the circumstances. And I'm going to set that goal to forgive myself for the imperfections 
and to my goal is to focus on the music and the more we focus on what does the committee think of me or what what do i do to win this competition or any of that stuff i think the more we kind of really hold ourselves back in general um and as part of that you'll see on the handout something where i put shoot for 90 percent in a performance and this is something i got from noah kagayama who if you haven't heard of him at the very end of the handout there's a link to a blog called the bulletproof musician and i've had the honor of working with noah dr kagayama many times and he's wonderful and has a lot of these ideas really come from him and when i was in a session with him once he said I think you're shooting for 110 percent and you really need to be shooting for 90 percent and i really disagreed with him because i thought no we have to go for our best you know we need to just go for it and i realized what he meant was that when we allow ourselves forgiveness that when we're on stage you can't play your best when there's a little bit of pressure it's always going to be not quite as good as when you're by yourself in a practice room and if you accept that and you say, sure, I know I'm going to make more mistakes than I did when I ran through it yesterday by myself. That kindness to yourself and that forgiveness of that acceptance, I should say, of that reality frees us. It frees us a lot more. If we're shooting for 110 percent and you miss a note, you're subconsciously telling yourself you're a failure for not for missing that note. So I bring all I bring that up as a really healthy goal for us to set. It doesn't mean that you don't try as hard as you can or that you don't practice as hard as you can or any of those things, but it means that you're giving that kindness and acceptance to yourself while you while you set those goals. So I wanted to make sure we had a little bit of extra time. I don't see, I don't think yet, I see lovely lots of hellos from Ohio and Germany and all these lovely people. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat here. Um, if not, I'm going to kind of chat a little bit about something extra. Um, so please go ahead and put them in if you'd like. There's something else that I do want to address, which is the physicality of playing our instruments. And actually, it goes along with the end of the question we have here about diet. Who we are as people and who we are physically and mentally affects this always. So if you have crippling anxiety all day long in your life, that's something to address and take seriously and seek help and seek encouragement. If you are a very tense person and you haven't, you don't breathe relaxedly when you play, that's going to affect this. So as you ponder yourself, what's your journey with this? A lot of times you really need to take a step back and say, who am I? How, what, how is my daily life? Do I take care of myself? Do I eat well? You know, do I sleep well? Um, more specifically to the diet question, I personally, haven't found that like a, a strong recommendation um, for everybody about diet. I think the biggest thing I would say about that, it's a great question, is um, I, I would kind of summarize that by saying you should experiment with what works for you. Some people find cutting out caffeine makes a huge difference. You know, some people find that when they discover allergies or something like that, that that makes a huge difference in how they feel. Um, I think the only other thing i would add personally besides experimenting with diet is to is to think about the timing of when you eat compared to when you play some people find a big difference actually when they have a big meal after a concert as opposed to before so that's a great question a um, couple of other questions here that are great um with beta blockers um i get asked that a lot and i think that as part of this whole conversation, beta blockers are something you'll hear about a lot, and I think it's great to talk about. Um, I think that what I would mention about that is that it is a tool that works fairly well as an assistive tool to some people, not all. And if you decide to try it, I think they sh beta blockers are to talk to a doctor. You have to talk to a doctor about it. Um, you need to do it only in the context of also thinking about a lot of the things we've talked about today. So I really don't like to say yes or no or whatever to beta blockers. I think it's just that what we're talking about needs to be your primary focus. And if you decide to go and experiment with beta blockers, make sure that it's not your primary method of dealing with confidence and performance anxiety. Thanks for asking that. Same thing with bananas. I ate a bunch of bananas before a concerto once. I think I ate five of them. <laughs> <laughs> and like just as a dinner and i'm pretty sure that it made me feel more sick because i had too many bananas and i was like i can't believe i've never eaten this many bananas in my life so 
<laughs> all things in moderation. <laughs> I think there is something about that though, in terms of the potassium, in terms of the um, the calming effect. And if, hey, even if it's only placebo, that's great too. Um, I, someone asked about the diaphragmatic breathing. Thank you for asking that. And I really want to bring this up because one, I, I think I'm going to show you a little bit of then a long story about breathing. I can't cover that in more than <laughs> less than an hour, but I'm going to say um, a very simple thing about diaphragmatic breathing. The diaphragm is a muscle kind of right about here. It's not something that we can, they say it's an involuntary muscle, but it, and it is, but it's something that we can control with the way that we breathe. And what a lot of us do when we breathe to play is we pick up our clarinet and we go, <gasps> as if you've seen a mouse. And as if you've like, it's the shock kind of <gasps> breathe. We breathe like tight up here. And reality, one of the things that I've learned and I have to really credit Jan Kagaris for talking to me at great length about this, is this idea that when we breathe in, our inhalations should feel like relaxations. And what I like to envision that as is that if you're breathing in and you have you have your kind of sternum here and you have your stomach here, if you're breathing in relaxedly and you're allowing the diaphragm to relax down, as you breathe in, your stomach should actually go out a little bit relaxed and you can get this feeling if you lay flat on the ground and you put your hand on your stomach and you feel nat you breathe naturally you'll feel as you breathe in your stomach breathes that your stomach goes out naturally and that sensation is the idea of inhalations relaxing it's the diaphragm actually relaxing as you breathe in so it, i would always encourage everybody to experiment with lay flat on your back put your hand on your stomach and just don't control your breathing, just observe it, and you'll feel that stomach just naturally go out a little bit. That's the feeling we want when we breathe into play, that our inhalations are relaxing us. And the reason this is so relevant is that the diaphragm is directly connected to the nervous system. And if we allow our diaphragm to relax and to breathe in relaxedly when we play, I think that over time, it makes an enormous difference in performance anxiety and in confidence and in our relaxed connection to our instrument. Thank you for asking about that. Um, I only have a few minutes here, so I'm gonna scan through here a little bit and some of these questions. I think we covered some of them already. Thank you for all of these wonderful questions. I think one of the ones here about, um, uh, an adult who's been playing for 12 years chamber music, my breathing becomes very shallow due to nerves. That's absolutely one of the big things that I would suggest to explore is to practice breathing relaxedly like we've talked about. And you can actually feel your breathing. Actually, if many of you lean, one of the things you can do to feel that depth of relaxed breath is if you were to lean forward onto your, just a little bit like to put, if you're sitting down, you put your forearms on your legs and just lean forward and breathe, that opens up the lungs in the back and it opens up that feeling of expans expansion in your breath. And trying to feel that and then feeling when I sit up comfortably, can I get that same depth? It takes practice and it takes experimentation to get there. But I think that if we incorporate that into our fundamental practice when you're warming up and when you're practicing at home, it'll gradually become a habit for you. Um, so, um, I think that a couple other questions here. Uh, Chris, hi. Any tips or advice for players who are struggling with keeping a steady sound when performing and the quivering, kind of like a, a, a quivering here? Um, I've struggled with that. A very long story short is that I've had that issue before. And I think actually in that particular instance, I would say two things. And this actually is relevant for a lot of specific issues with performance anxiety. The first thing is, being less focused on your embouchure and more focused on the free flow of air through your instrument helps with an issue with shakiness or instability here. Because we, we get taught by all our teachers to really focus on what you do with your embouchure, really focus on what you do with your oral cavity. And for many of us, what that does is incorporate a huge amount of tension in various places here. And we aren't just getting our air to naturally go through. So one of the biggest pieces of advice I give for that is to take your mental focus away from this. Let yourself do whatever embouchure you want for a while 
and just focus on, is there nothing getting in the way of the air going through the instrument? Um, the other part of that that I would mention is that if that sort of quivering is one of your symptoms of performance anxiety, you can use that same kind of gradual method that I mentioned at the very beginning here, which is, okay, let's say you do a run through by yourself in the practice room and you feel very confident and it's not quivering, or if it is quivering, it's fine. It's not in the way of your playing. Great. Then you do it, you know, you kind of gradually test yourself more and more with the goal of, great, I've had five or six really successful experiences being able to play and sure i quivered a little bit but i felt good and i could play well and that's always again what we're really trying to get at here in general with a lot of these goals is that maybe that'll happen a lot to you maybe that's going to happen in general in the future and be a part of your playing but if you can get to the point where you can go on stage and feel like cool i might get a little shaky here but I know I'm still going to play well. That's really the healthy goal that helps overcome that. Um, great. Um, last question here, I think, is any advice? I know we, we have to wrap up here. Any advice for feeling sick before a performance? And having water helps. Anything else to calm nerves? I think that actually maybe goes back a little bit to, um, I think it was Jessica's question about diet and about um, that sort of physicality when playing. Um, I think experimenting with to me, like feeling physically sick, like nauseated, it, it is something that can be helped with some of the other tools we're talking about and that I mentioned on the handout. But I think that um, experimenting with what you eat is a big thing. Um, and actually with the breath, um, calming your nervous system is extremely helpful. Um, if what I find, if I feel nauseated or if I feel sick, I'll lay flat on my back for a little while and I'll let myself return to my natural breathing state and relaxing and feeling that physicality in my body relax. And something else I'd throw out there is that it's actually, this is going to sound strange, but it's great to make yourself perform when you feel sick. And if you don't feel well, it's great to make ourselves still perform and play for other people and, you know, actually make ourselves be stressed out and perform stressed and be able to reflect afterward and say, hey, I felt sick when I was playing and I still played okay. And what that helps you do is if you start to feel sick, you won't be quite as worried about it as, as normal as you might have been in the past. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm really, really glad. Um, there's some wonderful questions here. There's some really thoughtful things. I would, I would love, um, thanks for your comments here. Um, I know where it's, it feels like this for me. I usually spend a lovely hour talking and answering all sorts of questions and, you know, having a great chat with a lot of people about this. So I would love if any of you don't feel like we really kind of got to your questions or to something that you really want to ask, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'd love to be in touch with you, see if there's anything I can do. Um, but I know that to kind of sum this up too is i know that even if you were just reading that handout there's a lot of information and things you can try and we also talked a lot today about a lot of things that you know a lot of different ideas and what i would really encourage everybody to do both for yourselves and both as teachers is to take something today that really resonated with you as i really want to do that and really commit to it and really try it and then after a month or two or after you have a performance revisit it and say, did that really help me? Did it, you know, was that, wow, like I felt good doing that. I want to keep that up. And maybe there'll be a different idea that you're going to try. Maybe you're going to try visualization for two weeks. Maybe you'll have a schedule of mock performances. You know, there's all sorts of things that you can do. But what I believe is so important is that no person has all the answers for you, for your journey with working through confidence, nerves, performance anxiety. And I fully admit, I don't for everybody, for anybody. But I would really think that the most important thing is that we say to ourselves, yes, we can commit to this and we know that this is something that we can improve on. We know that I know that this is something that I can make part of my practice. I can make part of my teaching. And at, over time, you will get, you will see progress and you will see improvement. And that journey is worth, worth it very much worth it.